we'll be in bed and I'll say, uh, you know, you really did treat me like a wife today. And he'll say, <laughs> did I? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, okay, sorry. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> because it's like, hey, listen, I want to do everything for you. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to make your life better. I yeah. want to serve you the best that I can. Like I yeah. do our children and like our friends. Yeah. But do not treat me like your wife. You can treat me like your girlfriend and we'll be fine. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I wanna help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick and I'm Pretty Intense. On the show today is the beautiful Gabby Reese. I have had the fortune of getting to know Gabby on a personal level. Um, she, of course, was a very famous volleyball player, and now she is um, a fitness guru. She is obviously wife to Laird Hamilton. They have incredible health food companies that are helping people every single day get away from things that are not helping their body. Um, but I really know her on the fitness level, and as time is going on more and more on a mental level where I just relate to her so much. I think that we have similar backgrounds of being female athletes and um, also purely just being athletes and the mindset that you need to have to succeed in your sport, which really translates to in this world. So we work out together. She recently took me to a pool workout uh, at her house where I, I'm pretty fit. I mean, I'm not going to lie, but there was some stuff I just literally couldn't do. And I've realized holding my breath is one of them. So she's really pushing me to stretch beyond my comfort zone into areas that I've never touched before. And I'm very inspired by that. I'm also inspired by her being so into wanting relationships to be good. She works really hard on her personal relationships, her marriage, the relationships with her kids. And she learned some really valuable things growing up about how to do that and the fact that she was never told that she had to be somebody when she grew up. So we talked about how that is now affecting her life as a mom, trying to send that same message. So I really hope you enjoy today's episode. Well, I, I finally decided to say yes to the pool workout mm -hmm. because we were doing this interview today. <laughs> Is that why? <laughs> kind of. I mean, there was like a couple other opportunities I probably could have done it, mm -hmm. but Soon I thought enough. this will be a really good thing to experience to understand a little bit more of the scope of what you do with workouts and, you know, what you've done so much, you know, your belief and your, the importance of breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, because Lord knows even at the workouts with weights that we do, when we do some breathing afterwards and you tell me to hold my breath for 90 seconds, I mean, I'm laying there going, 48, 49, I can't do it. Um, so it's really hard for me. So I know I need to do more of it. Um, but that was crazy. And it was really unique and different, which we're going to get into. But first and foremost, like you do free workouts every day with people. And I'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand, like, how did that start? Because every day means every day but Sunday, right? Right. Mm, what is it? Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday is in the gym. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday is in the pool. Mm -hmm. And there's anywhere from, you know, 20 to, in Hawaii, like 100 people. Yeah. So what started that? I, well, it's, it's sort of twofold. When I, Laird is from Kauai, and we lived on Maui for a really long time. And when we, we moved back to Kauai, they shut the gym. And so I had, I could use the hotel's gym. I was allowed to use it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, well, I could probably take my equipment. I had a bunch of equipment. And I thought, I told like six or seven of the girls that I was acquaintance with, maybe two close friends, but pretty much, you know, acquaintances. I said, you know what? I could rent out the community center three days a week for an hour and you guys can join me and we'll train together. Mm. And also that's a built-in accountability for me. Oh. Let's not, you know, kid ourselves and think I'm some Pollyanna like, oh. <laughs> it's, You're pretty Polly. You're very no, nice. No, but it's, it's also being clear that I can go down the rabbit hole on work emails and other things. And so it, I had to show up too. And before you knew it, it turned into 30 and then 40. And then, you know, on average, it was about 60 to 80 people. What? 
I did charge everyone a dollar though, because they weren't so they could be under my insurance. Oh, you know, so we had that's, a con- that's we had not, a contract, right? That's not a fee. That's being extra nice. That's well, the above and beyond nice. You know, a couple things happened. Is it was a classroom for me uh-huh. and uh, a way to you know, keep learning and a reason to keep learning because you had to show up and sort of like, could you be do it better? Or could you be better? Or could you add exercises or something like yeah. that? And then the other side of that was um, when I was in town, I, you know, I could do it. And I always told them this is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. So also it was done in a way that was very comfortable for me. I didn't have to deal with people's stuff because yeah. I'm not, you know, that's not really my thing. in stuff. Uh, you know, it's like if you're an instructor and you're a paid instructor, then you're beholden to everyone's whims and opinions. And I just shut all that down. That was pretty clear at mm. the top. So I also had the opportunity to construct it the way that it would work well for me. And so, um, and, and listen, it's a small place. You know what it's like to live in a small town. And so it was my community service, so to speak, because it was a way to give without actually having to get overly entangled so I could be at the grocery store and see people and just be like, hey. And they're like, that Gabby's so great. Because I was doing my community service. Mm. And, I, and that's important to me. It's really important. And, and then in, uh, in Malibu, I do it for my girlfriends there. And part of that joke was, how, if, you, if they pay you, that's even worse. Because then those girls are like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm an hour late. You know, it's like. It's true. Yeah. It's a bad business. Yeah, that's any, true, Any actually. business that takes just your real hours you know, you've learned over the years, like you have to have a business that makes money when you're asleep, not like mm-hmm. your real hours. I've yeah. done that. You yeah, know? that's right. And so this is a way, the way it moves was I can still be friends with them. They can't get distracted. They can't talk because they will. You I know, think the, I might've been the one talking this week when we started. Were you talking? And I was like, I better just, and then you said something and I basically just felt like it was for me. And I was like, totally respect that. I better shut up. (laughs) I don't think it was, but it's good. So I think that's how it started. And, and, um, you know, it's just a really easy way to give to my friends in a way that feels good to me Mm -hmm. and I have to show up and do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think it just works out. So I'm, listen, I'm sure I'm giving of my time, but I don't think, um, I'm, you know, I'm stretching that far. Do you feel like you would do a lot less if you didn't have that accountability? Or do you feel like you'd, I mean, I can't picture you doing a lot less. I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know that I'm like you in this way of like, <laughs> there, you have a, I'm very self-driven. You have another level of being self-driven. And also I am at the tail end of parenting three daughters and I am 12 or more years older than you are. And so I think you also get to a place where you're, you're tired. I'm a li- I can be tired. So mm. now I'm like, okay, I have to create an environment that I can be successful, not I'm just going to muscle through everything. Um, so I think it's also me being very clear about where I could fall off. Certainly I'm, I'm very disciplined and, yeah. and, and you're type A and, and self-driven, but life, when they say, you know, life gets in the way, life can get in the way, yeah. you know, this pick up or drop off this meeting, you know, whatever it is can get in the way. So I, I have a, you know, again, it's, I always tell people, listen, it's not about flying out of bed each day, so excited to be punished and punish yourself. It's about creating a system yeah. that, you know, you can be successful. Yeah. It's that punishing that I think is like the bad reputation, right? Like the punishment is like, oh, I gotta go work out. Yeah. It's not a punishment. It feels amazing. And it's really fun. And you create friendships as you know, you have a hundred people showing up for your workout. They like you. You're extremely likable, and you get. I, I don't think they do a like good me. Com- <laughs> they might not like you when like it's like bitch, Gabby. when you have to do like the six hop <laughs> knee up on the seventh side to side for a minute, or like pulsing no. lunges with the weights in your hands and your butt is on fire. But they love you overall for yeah. your you know kindness and your determination. But I feel like working out and even eating right has this like negative connotation, like it's a punishment to you, when really it's more about the ability to be able to is, you know, to be able to go move, to be able to go do those things, to be able to, to maintain that and have fun and create the relationships and friendships. And I just think there's like, it's just a bad rap that working out has. Well, okay. The other side of that could be you started in your life of discipline and, and a work ethic very early. So your work capacity and also the way your brain is hardwired naturally and magnified by your lifestyle 
uh, and you felt the feeling of how good it feels so many times yeah. that you're sold. You have people that don't feel well. Um, they're overwhelmed by their lives yeah. and their relationships. Maybe they don't love their job. I mean, yeah. you got to drive real fast yeah. around or do something pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And so I think sometimes it's just being aware that, not you, just me being aware that, um, and I came through sport. And so a lot of people haven't touched that feeling of like how powerful mm -hmm. it can be in your life. So it's really about getting them to go, okay, if you don't love it, can we get you to love the people you're going to train with? Or sure. can we get you to do it long enough that at least you put effort into finding out what you don't hate to True. move, yeah. right? Yeah, it's so just I finding think it's, something you enjoy doing enough to keep doing right. it. Or like today, I love the fact that our friend Emily is petrified of cold. Like she, no real fear. I had that no was idea. real fear. When she said yeah. in the uh, the truth the truth barrel, mm -hmm. which is two hundred and twenty degrees, it was yeah. two hundred twenty today. Um, and you sit in there and, and cook um, or cook the workout, as Laird would call it. And we're yeah. sitting in there, and she said she would rather go in a shark fe shark infested water yeah. than go in cold water. I was like, oh, this girl's really scared. Um, yeah. But Emily went in the water and she did it. And she like, I don't know if you saw, she posted an Instagram I picture and the co <laughs> it's like super long. It's basically like a confessional and a, like a, uh, you know, just like pouring of joy. Yeah. And she said she's on a high. And that is something to get used to too. Like, you know, overcoming fear for a second or getting to the point where you're uncomfortable, but you know, pushing through, right? Like, can, yeah. like you say to us when we're working out, like, can you stay with me for another, mm -hmm. if it's, if it's holding your breath, another five, zero seconds. I'm like, that's 50. Just say it. It's 50. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're like eight seconds. Come on, let's go. Yeah. And you know, it's that, you know, that feeling that you get afterwards. Cause there's no, you know, to get a reward, you have to go through a little bit of pain or a little bit of discomfort in yeah. order to feel some kind of reward other than otherwise you're just walking and talking and just going about your normal day. And I think that that's something that people, I feel like maybe that's something that I was, I practiced doing my entire life was, was bumping into discomfort because that's what driving was. It right. was like, I wasn't comfortable crashing. I wasn't comfortable sliding, but I had to get I had to continuously bump up against my comfort zone sure. every freaking lap. Yeah. That was my job. Yeah. And I don't even like that job. But right. that became really something that I, you know, got comfortable with, right? Get find comfort in the discomfort. Yeah, and I think I think, you know, we live in a world where we're everything's comfortable, right? We have air conditioning, we have That's heat true. and um, we drive places and and food is readily available and things like that. So I think the other side of that is when you get, we talked about this earlier, when you can provide healthy opportunities and that just means non-self-destructive to meet yourself yeah. Yeah. and to say, oh, okay, there I am and meet your character and do things that make you uncomfortable because then we're expanding still, yeah. right? Instead of, well, I don't do that because I'm this age or, um, you know, all of these limitations. And I think that you have to, cr you know, create that tension, positive tension, so that you can continue to expand yeah. and grow. And, um, and, and for me, you know, life is a forward moving process versus, well, you know, back then that was pretty great. And I really enjoyed that back there. I'm still trying to continue to look forward to things and uh, to be comfortable with, with that. Are you someone who, what, how do you answer if I said, if you could go back and change anything in your life, what would you change? Well, I mean, you know, I could give you the pat answer of like, oh, well, I would change nothing and I wouldn't be here as I am today. Listen, there's some things I've gone through as a parent that have been pretty uncomfortable, and even those I wouldn't change. I would say I would have stretched more. That's it? Just stretch your body, you mean? Absolutely. Huh. Because I think I, I missed an opportunity to avoid injuries mm. by having better range, safer range <laughs> of motion and things like that. But um, you realize that's a fairly small I wish I would have, right? Like, this isn't like, man, I wish I wouldn't have, you know married that guy, or I wish oh. I wouldn't have taken that. I wish I wouldn't have moved here. I wish I oh. wouldn't have, I wish I, th those are a little bigger. Stretching, I think we can say that's a fairly small, like, man, if I could look back and just like, maybe pull anything out of it, I'd just yeah. say maybe more stretching. 
Yeah, and I think, listen, when I was competing, I, I wish I wasn't so concerned about pleasing everyone. Yeah. I think I, if you ask me something, if I could have approached it differently as a 20 and early 30-something woman, you know, there was a part of me that yeah. was apologetic for attention and for other things that did have, especially when you play team sports, so there was something uncomfortable about that. And I think in a way you sort of think, oh, I wasn't as robust as I could have been as an athlete, as an outspoken person and things like that. So, I mean, on another, on a deeper level, I think um, that's something. But I, I think we don't get to know that mm -hmm. until we actually get to go through that. Yeah. Well, that's part of the process. Right. If you'd have just known that then, it would have all been easy and there would be no room for growth. Yeah. And maybe, you know, it's like I had, I knew a few female athletes that, you know, had a few older brothers and they got to that real quick because they just knew it wasn't personal. Mm. And I think for other women, I mean, it feels to me that you have the opportunity to sort of teeter in between where for me, it took me a little bit longer to be like, yeah, okay, you're, you are about upset about something about me or something I've done or um, you think something about the way it's going for me is unfair and... Mm. I don't need to show you like I'm a good person by trying to manage how you're feeling. And I think that takes a minute to, in, in, in everything, right? In business, in personal relationships. Why did you feel like you had to justify yourself? Well, I've or said this feel a, guilty? Well, I've said this a few times. I wasn't really groomed for success. You know, Laird nor myself grew up in environments where, because there's a, you have, sort of have to learn that. I think the, the disservice parents do is when they overinflate to their children, like how great you are. Mm -hmm. But I think there is something to be said for saying it's okay to win. It's okay to expect to win when you go out and do whatever endeavor you're doing. Um, you don't have to apologize to win. You don't have to um, feel like that makes you not a nice person because you know, also in volleyball, right? Your opponent's right here, like right mm. there. And so it's like, okay, like if the goal is to win, we'll just then go ahead and crush them. But when you're growing up, spike it on her head. Yeah. And it's, but that <laughs> doesn't I'm make sure you, you bad, a ton. A, you know, a bad per, you know, sort of bad. So I think it took me a really long time. And also if you've grown up a certain way and then all of a sudden you think, Oh, I want to build a different kind of life. Right. Um, that takes getting used to what that looks like and what feels comfortable to who you really are and not in an overcompensation way. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, I think it's yeah. all of that. Yeah. What do you feel like was the first thing that popped up for you where you're like, man, I'm going to have to get over this. Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, listen, all you have to do is add kids to any formula and you have no time to mess around without those ideas. And also you go through enough things where, you realize you can't please any, everyone anyway. Right, 100%. I and a, if you do, then you're probably pretty damn boring. Well, you just, but you can't, right? You can't. Like you're on the fence. I had a coach, my college coach, we were discussing her earlier, and she said to me something really powerful that I probably caught on to 10 years after the fact. She said, like, when she coaches, she's got 12 athletes, six play all the time, eight are playing regularly, right? right? So she goes, that means at least I have six to four people, four to six people that are unhappy or pissed off. Mm -hmm. And she says, I have a job to do. And my job is to look what's the greatest combination for the goal. And she goes, and then at least at the end of the day, I know one person is happy. And she said, me. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, what I've learned is I have to listen to myself and I have to trust that and let the chips you know, are you a people pleaser? Like, are you? No, a, you, no? I, I wouldn't say it's that. It's trying to be hyper conscientious that you're not are taking you, things. Do you have a lot of empathy? I mean, I feel like I'm. Yes and no. Like in certain ways, not at all, right? Like in certain ways, everything is through my cranium, and it's. But it's also being sensitive to if you're fortunate, if mm -hmm. you've been given opportunity. Because well, you're past. Yes, and I think it's not about you know. So you're always kind of checking to make sure that you're clear about that you're living by the values mm -hmm. that you have and that you're honoring, like someone handed you the baton for a minute yeah. and other people have the baton and the, my baton has moved around. But I think it's, it's more of me checking in on myself because at the end, when I brush my teeth, I just need to make sure that yeah. I'm clear and comfortable with the way I'm behaving. Hmm. And it's certainly gotten easier as I'm older. It's like, 
yeah, okay, I can't do that. I can't do that tap dance anymore, (laughs) you know? Yeah, I'm not going to put myself through that. I agree. Um, Like, so as according to fitness, like when I go work out with people, Mm -hmm. I love making up workouts, right? Like, I mean, I love it. And you make them up during your coffee, which is like what I do too. So I think one of the hardest things for people, because I really believe fitness is a way to grow confidence and to be empowered. And that just seeps into your life everywhere. It can help you grow and be brave enough to stand in who you really are and what you want and face challenging things. How, how did you learn? I mean, how did you learn how? Most people never learn how to even work out. Like, I, I'm a judger of the gym. You? I'm a super judger. Do you have yep. opinions? I, I, no way. Especially in the gym. <laughs> um, and it's like, but I actually have learned to feel a little bit more sympathy and understanding that when I see somebody on the elliptical, they probably don't know what else to do. Yeah. You know, when I see somebody doing half of a push up, I'm like, they probably don't really know what to do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I judge that, but I don't think there's a lot of education. I mean, aren't they even go, aren't they even doing away with some physical fitness in school and stuff? I mean, I feel like PE yeah, is not even really it. a thing. Yeah, they can't afford it. Which is just crazy. Cause yeah. look, doing a pull up could save your life. Right. If you fall off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> well, they say, right, push up and pull up is two of the greatest real strength building. You have, to, if you can't do them, that, I mean, literally one of those could save your life, where I'm pretty sure knowing geometry is not going to save my life. Where, where are you hanging out, Danica? That you're like falling off mountains or what? Yeah. Um, I'm not super brave, so. Um, <laughs> are your hikes risky or what? Yeah. You know what? <laughs> it's saving my dog when they get out onto an edge. And I'm like, oh, shoot get back here now and then I have to tiptoe out there and they're billy goats and I'm like I'm scared no get over here um if I fall I can do a pull-up though um but how did you how do you even learn how well you know listen coming from professional sports I and being in California you I've had the luxury of having access to some of the best movement people yeah out there so through yeah. trainers yes and then you know just out of necessity like when the class developed it was like oh Okay, I, I got to figure this out. And then, you know, we have one of the businesses we have. Um, but that's exp- brave. You realize that, right? Like, you're like, I'm going to have a class. Oh, God, I, I got to make up a workout. Oh, like, some people would that never brave. do that. They can't even make it up for themselves if they do it at home. Yeah, they would I, sooner sit there. It, it's not that brave. I think, listen, it's if you say. It's more brave than you think. I, I don't. I, more ambitious than you think, maybe then. I think if you pay attention in life, and especially when you're exposed to environments, I think you. The opportunity to pick things up is is pretty real if you're really paying attention, mm-hmm. and um, and I think the willingness to say I may not be perfect, but I'm really going to give it everything I have. Um, that usually kind of makes things work out. Well, I think that that amount of humility resonates with people, right? If you said they're like you give it up on the front end and say like, okay, it might not be perfect today. Or like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this, you know, forgot this station, you know, get that. Like people, that makes you approachable. Well, okay, so here's what I know about teaching, especially big classes, is I'm not there to show you that I can dominate you. I'm there to create an environment for you to get a good workout in. And so one part of that is I, I have another side of my personality and a character that's like, no, let's not screw around. Why? So that the environment is set, that there's order. You need order in order to execute everything. And so there's one side where I'm like, I'm not here to dominate you or sh- make it impossible for you. And the way I'm going to show you how much I care about you and love you is I'm going to keep order so that you leave with having success. And that means if anyone threatens that order, mm-hmm. they will have a they will hear it from me. Yeah. And very quickly. And so there's it's sort of twofold where there's a part of me that's like, you know, I have kicked people out of class. The joke is I have two close friends that I'm like, if you continue to talk, I'll kick you out. And <laughs> and they look at me and these yeah. are my friends. Yeah. And in that moment I'm like, yeah, no, try me. Because yeah, what they're doing, they're not paying and there's order. Well, they and have we have 15 orders. other people or 50 other people yeah. that it's not about you and it's not about me. Mm-hmm. We're all going to play by the rules and do it. So I think within it, it's like an interesting thing. What, what do they say? Be in charge, not in control. Right. I'm not here to control everybody. Mm. I'm just here to be in charge. Mm, that's where I suffer. What do you mean? You want to control everything? Because when I see them just doing a poor movement, I'm like, oh, my God. 
Yeah. Just do it a few. How more. do you handle Just that? Just do it, it a few more years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you'll get tenderized by that whole thing. <laughs> I've found that one of the things, if because I've really only taught a few classes, yeah, of workouts, um, uh, which I had a good time. But I'm a drill sergeant. Like, sure. I'm, I'm, I see that about I, you. I love that about you. That's what, when you walked in the first day to the workout. When I my first day, I was like, I love her already because you're very strong and don't, let's not mess around we're here to work out we're not here to hang out right and um but i think that uh one of the most difficult things other than trying to get everyone to do everything properly is just to make sure no one gets hurt that's it that's that's the key and also you have to realize half of them are are more successful and even have accomplished beyond what you could want for them in a perfect push-up the fact that they're there yeah. And I think it's yeah. recognizing that. And then slowly you yeah. go, hey, let's watch that. And hey, yeah. watch that. And they start to put it together. And by the way, there's some people who never put it together. I have people in my quiet class for eight years. And I'm like, still doing that move, huh? Pretty yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> and you just realize. It's an air squat, not a forward fold. It's just. It's okay. It's the way it is. And also, I, again, I that's another thing about maturity for me uh, is uh, everybody has their way. Mm-hmm. What, um, what about you and Laird working out together? Yeah, not so much. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm asking for tips because Aaron doesn't only, work out with me much either. Only in the pool um, do Laird and I work out because we're underwater. <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of talking and there's sort of like pockets of working out going on. And there's music. On. There's music underwater. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. You have to. You it's have amazing. To. When you do long holds, like back and forth, back and forth six times or whatever, oh. sometimes you're like, just listen to the music. I think... Um, by the way, just so people get some perspective yeah. on the back and forth six times, I do back, then I go forth. And each time I take a breath, and you're saying you go back and forth without taking a breath. So that's just, you're, I'm doing one, you're doing six in And a I've row. been doing it for 11 years. Mm -hmm. So, so that's it, it was, you've done it once. I know you have these standards like <laughs> this. Just want people like to have a reference for how good you are at it. Uh, I'm just experienced. Okay, okay. I am experienced, and uh, I have some comfort in the water. But I so think you just look at each other underwater and dance, and just be like, "Oh, nice move." But oh. um, you know, both Laird and I are very bossy people mm -hmm. in our own ways. And so, what I do, what in our training life, we use each other as confidants, and and sort of like if I'm thinking about something, or I'll use him because he he I really respect his opinion about the about movement. And Laird is I'm very linear, and he's very very creative. And so it's, an, it's a very nice balance. And also his relationship, I have a good relationship with discomfort. His relationship with discomfort is uh, like, I, I can't keep up with that. It's like a best friend. <laughs> he just, he just, he's, you know, listen, he's hardwired. I've seen a lot of athletes, very, very good athletes, some of the best in the world. And maybe two or three guys like Laird where, um, their ability to manage that is pretty, I mean, he, you know, his sport probably helped with that, getting his brain dialed into um, a level of intensity and seriousness that um, the repercussions are, are pretty serious. So like what? Well, I mean, if you ride, if you surf a wave that is 80 feet tall, um, if you wipe out or mm -hmm. you don't make the right choices, um, I don't know if the white water on a wave like sure. that is a 35 feet, wow. is a three story building and that's the white water. What does that mean? So when the wave breaks and then you have like this oh, foam, okay. so yeah. you know, when you go to the beach and the little wave breaks and here comes the white water uh -huh. that's like by your yeah. ankles. Yeah. Well, that is 35 feet. Jeez. And so you're just talking about a different environment. Yeah. You know, people who do things in a, you know, mountain climbers or, you know, but at least the mountain's fixed. Um, right. You know, even for Aaron, like you have guys who want to rip your head off. Your your brain is working differently. And so I like to train with Laird, but I'm trying to be married to Laird as a husband and wife. What's that like? And not to be competitive. What's that like? <laughs> it's. Well, I mean, like, what's it like? What's it? Because you, you, we both are, and I think that you know. Similarly, with Aaron and I, you know, both being athletes, we mm -hmm. we both are too, and I get very soft, Danica. You do very. You're the one that softens. Nice. Well, Laird is very loving mm -hmm. and attentive. You know, he's a person who's like I feel very cherished by Laird, but um, I don't direct Laird. I mean, I sort of in encourage Laird and and sort of. Um, you know, 
finesse things, but um, I don't usually come at him very hard unless it's for a real reason, and that may be once or twice a year. And when I do... a good story of one of those times? uh, Well, no. I mean, you have to remember, too, we work together. Yeah. Sometimes is it business-oriented then? Uh, It's more about the way I I get spoken to. So if I'm managing Uh 100 details and you're frustrated about some commitment... um, I'll, I'll let it go for a while because what I, what I love about him is because he is sort of this artist. He really is. Mm-hmm. Um, and he need, you have to realize if you were going to race, you knew the day and the time he's waiting for something. So there's part like this of this week, there was a big waves in Fiji. Two, so. two day notice, three Boom. day notice. And he goes to meet the swell. Once the conditions all sort of say, yes, it's all working. The that wind and the swell. For me. But think it's about him. like being on call. Being on call and being ready. And the other side of it is, so there's a part of him that wants to feel like at any moment, I have the freedom to go. Right, right. And we have commitments like months and months out. Right. And that's hard on him. And what I love about him is his, the way he has a, he's the most disciplined person I know, but within that too, he's also very, very free and wild. And as his partner, I don't want that to go away. Right, because that's what makes him, right? Correct. So, so how if does he that gets work? Like, what's bratty, the guys, what's then I'm like, oh, I get it. It's connected to all that great stuff I love. Right. But after a while, if it gets taken out on me, it's kind of like this. It's like, like any relationship. I think people can have bad moods, bad days. Mm-hmm. And I always said, if you could make me feel like I was inside the bubble yeah. and not take it out on me or alienate me because you're going through that, I'm not going to hassle you. I'm not right. going to tell you to feel different. Right. Just respect me. Don't direct it at me. And also uh, allow me to be inside. It's when people shut down, isolate, and push you out. So, Totally agree. And that didn't happen in the first three years of our relationship. Do you think that's a male thing? (laughs) I think think it's more male than female. But if you have a competitive person or an intense person or... um, maybe per, a person who lives in their in their mind, yeah. their tendency is to go inside, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's just understanding how to dance during those times yeah. and uh, also be reminded all the time, and I do this in parenting, there are some traits about my children that are very challenging, and it is exactly the same thing that will make them dynamic, interesting. Sure, hu- the polarity you know, of it, right? Adults. What you hate, you love too, for certain right. reasons. Um, was this something in the beginning that you would force you to feel insecure? Like, did- no, I'm not insecure. I think just pissed. And, um, and, uh, you know, the, our, the first five years of our relationship, um, you know, we had a, we have had and still have a pretty, um, magnetic draw to one another. But after about five years, I was very... I got sort of tired because I'm very even killed. So I got very tired or resentful of Laird's moodiness. However, I didn't speak up. Mm. So uh, the thing I learned after, you know, we had our challenges earlier in our relationship was it was better to have one really uncomfortable conversation or healthy conflict than to just go, well, I love him. So I'll sweep it under the carpet. Right. And Laird is very good about clearing the decks. Like every day, like we go to bed, that the, our relationship are, is as clear as this table because, yeah. you know, it's just easier to go, I need to talk about something and they go, what? And you go, oh, this instead of like, oh, that. Mm-hmm. And you can't even get to right. what is the real issue Sure. versus, but again, a lot of these things take making mistakes and, um, and maybe even thinking you're not going to be together and then sort of saying, well, it's worth it. So why we're not going to be miserable. So let's work on it. Let's make it so that we are separately and together. Um, you know, I hate the word happiness. Uh, it's in, it's it's in a joyful place. It's in a peaceful place. You know, happiness sort of comes in and out. And I, I don't even know that happiness is a sort of a goal of mine. Um, I, I really enjoy peace. and What is then? I think peace is important for me. As I heard Naval Ravikant say that happiness was peace in motion and that you could access it any time if you had peace. And I sort of really liked that idea. Yeah. Um, and growth. I think Laird and I independently really enjoy, you know, t- trying to expand. What have you learned about yourself in the 21 years that you've been married? 
Oh my God. Because it's really about the self, right? I mean, it's, you know, instead of what have you learned about the relationship, it's really mm -hmm, about you, mm -hmm. right? Because they're all different. Yeah. And you are the common denominator. Yeah. You can well, only that's control very yourself. true. And that's anytime right. you're looking outside of yourself to feel good, it's either not going to happen or be extremely inconsistent and unpredictable and right. not rely. You can't rely on that forever even. So what have you learned about yourself? I think I learned that I, I was not raised in a way to rely on someone else to make me happy. Hmm. And so I think what's good about Laird and being with Laird is um, he's a very generous and loving person. Um, but... I think he feels the same way. It's like we, we joke, you know, like you go and make yourself happy. I'll go make myself happy and then, and then we can be together. Mm -hmm. So I think what I've learned is that I, I think I always felt that way. And mm -hmm. I wasn't looking for someone to rescue me or save me or pay my bills. I was looking for a partner. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also that I wanted somebody that if it really came down, like if, you know, it all hit the fan, that um, someone who could handle it. Because I've seen Laird in action, you oh know, a handful God. of times in our relationship. Like you mean save your house from burning down in Malibu? Exactly. Like I could do that. <laughs> I mean, I know. seriously. Yeah. I mean, that's like, what I mean. Like I'm a very, in a way, I hate to he say. He literally fought the fire. I think it's important yeah. people know that he was out there with <laughs> yes. like hoses, buckets, friends, like I'm going to fight this fire. And yeah. he saved the house. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. That's fantastic. Like I'll deal with emails and all the other <laughs> stuff. And if like, you know, things happen because I, I realize like. I was, I was raised in the Caribbean, right? So um, I think I was always clear about survival. And what Laird also represents to me and the thing I've learned about myself is that feels pretty important. Meaning let's not get distracted by all the stuff and the noise and all of the chaos around us. Let's be really clear. Life is pretty simple. You know, it's like you need to eat, you need to sleep. You wanna feel safe. And, um, and you want to have a partner that you love and that loves you and things like this. And so I think Laird is a real manifestation of how I really do, even though I like to be challenged and busy with work and all of these things, that um, it's pretty simple for me. Do you feel like you're kind of mirrors for each other? Like you're so similar in that way that you really are yeah. two people that and it sounds, it probably felt selfish or not culturally normal to be like, oh, have a partner and just fall right into it. You just blend into each other and be like, you know, somewhere deep down, you really want to go do your own thing. Yeah. Which means you're going to respect and see that in a partner too. He, yeah. You know, without you, he'd be lost, vice versa, because you both need that space, but you both want that space. So it's perfect. You can see it in each other. Yeah. And I think you can not take it personal that the other person has something they have to go do. Mm -hmm. And Laird has a lifelong love affair with his sport. And I, I think it's, it's such a, a, a great quest. Does, like for me, I'm like, I, I support that all the way. Does, um, does the wave always win? Oh, his girlfriend? Mm -hmm. I would say there, he never has to make that choice. And um, I think what it is, is that he knows that. And also the wave goes away at nighttime. Like Laird was leaving to Fiji last night and he said, I really wish though, like I could have my family with me. So when I come home, we are all in the same, you know, we're mm -hmm. in the bed together. We mm -hmm. eat dinner together. His family is very important to him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not possible to do. He did take one of our daughters, but I think um, it's not an either or. And um, he feels comfortable and you feel comfortable to say, I get that the wave wins, but it only wins because it's temporary. I'm always here. Well, yes. And, and she comes so infrequently. And also he, he's, he's quite delightful when he comes home from surfing. And so uh, <laughs> I'll take it because otherwise he can get a little bit like a caged yeah, animal. I and, think... and so I, I just, I sort of feel like people, that's why if they can develop their own passions, yeah. Um, they won't think of it as something in conflict with the love that their partner has for them, but rather something that feeds their partner and makes them really better when they come. Yeah. come I think to. that that's a valuable lesson. I think that, you know, I've even dealt with my own insecurities about that. Like when somebody has something that that's their you own. Have? Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually, I don't understand why yeah. when you say that, like you're, you're a very defined person to me. 
I am, I mean, I am growing out of it, but have been a jealous type. And I broke it actually down to the fact that it finally, like just in a conversation with a friend, I realized that my example growing up of a relationship Mm -hmm. was spending 100% Mm -hmm. of the time together. My parents worked together, took trips together, never did anything with, my mom never had girlfriends. My dad never went out with the guys. Like my parents were together 100% of the time and that was my example of a good relationship. And they've been married since 1980. And I'm not good at math, so it's a long time now. But that was what I saw. So for me, it's really hard to break that, that, um, yeah, it's a model. It's a mental yeah, that model, model for sure. So, yeah. but I've I've always been that person that's kind of you know either that or kind of felt like maybe the maybe the outward cry would be that you know I I like want to be I want to be there for all the fun too you know oh you have a little FOMO a little FOMO okay a little bit of FOMO a little bit of like jealousy of time mm-hmm. um, but it's true when you go away and do your own thing. Like when I've, and I've learned this over time, when I go away and do my own thing and spend time with my girlfriends or go do something that fills me up, something, even th- this show has done that for mm-hmm. me. Like I come back better for the other person because I'm energized. I'm excited. I'm happy. I've been, I'm, my cup is filling up in a way that he can't do, you right. know, but it, it's only filling up for him. Right. Like at the yeah, end of the day, for I you. come home to him and, and for, for me. You. Right? right. So when our cups are full for both sides, like we're we don't have as much animosity resentment jealousy anger boredom frustration Mm -hmm. like we're just like having a good time we're happy right we're happiness we're we're Mm -hmm. we're peace in motion yeah and i think life is really really short and if we can figure out how to make our relationships rich and simplified yeah um i think it's a it's time. It's an effort well spent because if you really think about the times that we spent in conflict about things or even fretting about things, even outside of our relationship, um, it's too, life's too short. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I think uh, also people will be with us because they want to. And if they don't want to, they won't. That's actually something that I have thought so many times. And I think I maybe said it even before. Like, you know what? And it sounds kind of mean in a way because it seems really like blunt. But I'm like, look, you're you still you're still here. You still want to be with me. So I need to realize that it's because you want to. Of course. Instead of look for all the reasons why I'm not good enough or right. I'm not smart enough or funny enough or pretty enough or ambitious enough or, you know, not enough, period. You Isn't know? it funny, though, that it can, a person can be have so many things going for them? And like outwardly, right? Like, never mind. Okay, someone who lives in a small town and they have a nice job. They're an attorney and they have a nice job and they're, you know, all these things. You've lived in a world. You've been on a big stage. You've had a lot of people tell you from your group to the media about how great you are. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's such an important point that unless we can feel those ways about us and not in an inflated way. it does really impact so positively the rest of uh, you know your life, your relationships, and um, you know I always joke with Laird after I mean literally in November we'll be together for 24 years and I'm like, you know you're here always like I always want him to feel like, oh yeah I can go anytime I want because then he doesn't feel the, the there's no pressure about being there. It's understanding like I'm exactly where I want to be. When you look at it like that, if you go, there's no pressure to be here, you're free. Right. And that person keeps coming home to you. That means more than if they feel trapped. Right. You know, so that's if you can just like let go of the control and the wanting of something for yourself so much yeah. and love the person totally no matter what it yeah. is. And they are free to go like they can go do what they want and go period if they want. And they know that. Mm-hmm. And if they keep coming back, that actually speaks significant volumes compared to the other where it's like, right. oh, yeah, <laughs> all handbrakes got me at home. Can't go yeah. do anything. Oh, I kind of got to lie to her and say I was. Yeah. I mean, that's that's shitty. Laird, so Laird there's so much have... fulfillment in the freedom for yourself if you can just get there. Well, and, you know, I'm coming home to Laird. He's not coming home to me. Let's just be clear about that. I'm still coming home to him. <laughs> Why um, do you say it like that? I'm joking. <laughs> I'm kidding. He's not coming home Is to me. Is this title on the house? He's, or? he's uh, 
<laughs> no, it's all, it's all sure. You know? <laughs> no, I'm joking. But I think um, the other side of that too is, uh, you know, I've had once in a while, if we get a little bit husbandy, wifey kind of thing, we'll be in bed and I'll say, um, and pretty matter of fact, like I'm actually not emotional. Uh, I'm lucky for Laird. I'm not, oh, I really take my time. To, to respond to things, mm -hmm. especially the heat, if they get heated, you oh, know, okay. I don't just go, uh, you know, you're cool and I mean, you have to really get me good for me just to go straight at Is it. Is he more ballistic? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, he's not ballistic. He's, he's interesting. He's purely emotional and sort of intuitive, but the heavier a situation gets, the more calmer it gets. Right. So he, but he's all emotional, you know? And so, um, it's the hundred we'll, foot wave he's looking at. He goes, Oh yeah, he slows it way down, right? And uh, we'll be in bed and I'll say, uh, you know, you really did treat me like a wife today. And he'll say, <laughs> did I? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, okay, sorry. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> because it's like, hey, listen, I want to do everything for you. Yeah. You know, I want to I wanna make your life better. I yeah. want to serve you the best that I can. Like I yeah. do our children and like our friends. Yeah. But do not treat me like your wife. You can treat me like your girlfriend. And we'll be fine. That's actually great. Yeah. That's and I don't fantastic. say more than that. I just I say, love that. you know, you, you kind of treated me like your wife today. And he'll say, did I? Sorry. Oh, that's a bad thing then. Well, it's just, it's, it's the a little thing take of you like, for granted. It's a little like it's the it. norm. Like you do this, I there do that. She is it's again. a little yeah. like little yeah. passive. Yeah. It's not so sparky, engaging, yeah. and and joyful. Yeah. It's like, it's like just, it is whatever. Yeah. Oh my God. I so, love and that. I don't have I'm to say more than that. Um, that. Maybe I should just stay his girlfriend forever. Listen, it's Does all it titles like and <laughs> baloney anyway. I've seen people who are in relationships that yeah. are more married than married people. The institutions of the world are really interesting to me. And, and marriage is one of them because, you know, look, if you got married and you, you know, back in the old days before they had tattoo removal, it'd be like a tattoo. Like it's just there forever. Yeah. But, you know, nowadays, especially, and even in the past, you could still separate and you could still divorce, but it's so much more normal now. It kind of makes you question the institution when... But, you know, kids come into the picture and it kind of makes it interesting, which, you know, like, yeah, I mean. There's all there's all parts of points of that star. And I think a lot of as long as the couple's on the same page, like, hey, do you feel good? Do you feel good? Yeah. I mean, I've heard stories of people. Who, I have a friend who was together with her partner for 30 years. And I think for like insurance, like as they got older, they oh. decided to get married. And this is a couple so oh. dedicated and committed to each other. So they were together, but not married for like 30 years. Yeah. And then they went and got married. And she said to me though, and this is a, like, this was like, they were completely fine. And I mean like a very beautiful couple, like very loving. And she said, you know, it was interesting though. There was something interesting about maybe the ceremony like the notion of we're going to stand up and do this. And I think everybody's different. I think, you know, the girls that have those crazy weddings, I, for me personally, in the language I speak, I'm like, why would you not put it like buy a house? Like, you know what I mean? Like when totally. I see all this, like it's the prom adult prom. Mm -hmm. And then I think, okay, when it's all done and there, there you are. It's like all that show and all that buildup and all that stuff. And then in the end, though, it's like, it's, it's just, just us. Yeah. On couch with a picture of that ceremony that you can oh, do. It's on. just one little moment. Yeah. And so I think. Okay, everybody you know. jump. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what it's you got. That. That's all. That's your memory. So I, I just, I think, uh, I think it's whatever works for the people. But again, just loving someone and yeah. cherishing them. I think if you're you get, getting that, how did you guys learn how to communicate? Because I think communication is one of those things mm -hmm. like there has, it's just difficult. Yeah, sure. I think it's trial and error. I mean, we, we did almost break up that one time and that lasted off and on for about a year. And then you get to a place where you go, okay, so is it worth it to stay together? And, and once it, you decide, yes, it is. I think this is another thing I find fascinating with people even in their regular everyday lifestyle, well, this isn't working for me and I don't like this, but yet, you know, it's the same behavior over and over. I think there comes a point like in the relationship where we're like, okay, this wasn't totally working. So what do we want to do to change? Um, and it isn't me telling Laird, this is how you can change. Mm -hmm. It was me having to look at myself and say, okay, I'm not, I wasn't willing to be vulnerable or I was too afraid so to you be put vulnerable. put it on yourself first. Well, that's who I'm responsible for. Right. Laird is responsible for himself. Right. And I can say, hey, when this behavior comes out, that makes me uncomfortable. Like, so if you're acting a certain way sure. um, or talking to me in a certain way, I'm not comfortable with mm. that. 
Instead and, of saying, don't do that, you go, when you do this, yeah. I feel really unimportant. Or when you do this, I yeah. feel offended, you yeah. know? And it's about how you feel, and they can decide what to do with it. And, with and it, that's on want. him. Yeah. You know, if he wants to, you know, I always said, like, uh, if you, if we're all bringing our best, chances are we're going to, we, you can muddle through some stuff. Yeah. Because if the intention is, I don't need to be right, I'm just looking to reach a resolution, then you can really go far there. And the intention is also, I'm going to genuinely look out what's best for you. And that person's on the same page. Um, and, and, you know, you can get through a lot of stuff. And, you, and also, when you practice getting through it, I do think it's like, you can get through it faster and faster. You know, Laird and I had like, the smallest conflict. I came home an hour later than I was supposed to be home. And when I walked in, he's like, oh, I thought you were coming home an hour ago. And I was like, first of all, like my instant, my reaction is like, like, you're not my dad. Like I'm a grown ass woman. Like you're not my dad. Like, <laughs> I don't know. But I was in traffic. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Oh, that was so fun. Yeah. Ooh, an hour late. Cause I, I was on it. It traffic. Was, it was a little slow. <laughs> and then we got to dinner and he was being, he's Dennis the menace a little, <clears throat> like he'll kind of poke and try to get reactions. <laughs> Cause he's just, a, that's him. And so I was sitting at dinner and he, I go, so, oh, they said something about the training. Oh, what'd you guys do today? He's like, oh yeah, we laid around. And I was like, Oh, okay. I'm so I was like quiet. That. <laughs> and so then after he, he started to pick up on the vibration, he's like, what's up? And I go, here's the deal. When I walk in, and I'm an hour behind, uh, don't question me, say hello, get up, give me a kiss. And when I ask you how your training was, tell me how your training was like that. But I wasn't freaking out. Yeah. And then he started laughing. <laughs> and then I, of course, started laughing because it's so small. And yeah. then he goes, well, okay, I'll tell you about my training. I go, no, I don't care anymore. That's what you don't understand. Like <laughs> yeah. I'm over that. One shot. <laughs> and I don't think it's so, I don't think it's about being hysterical. I don't think it's about any of that, but I think it's about going like, you know, I've had to remind Larry, we have three daughters. Sometimes he'll talk to me in that tone mm. and I'll just look at him and I'll go, I just want to remind you, I'm your wife. I'm not your daughter. Like, mm. and that's all I have to say. I don't have to go like, nah, 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 nah. it's like, you know, and, and also being your best. I think if I look to him and I see a guy who's really trying his best, it inspires me. And conversely, sometimes he might have a dip and he's funky and he's stomping around. If I hold my high line, mm -hmm. I find that he will look and see and be more inspired to come back up right. than if I go, you need right. to come back up. Right. And so I think, you know, you just learn, but it's, are you being honest about why you're there? And if you need to be in control of somebody, then you should be at least with somebody who wants to be controlled. Because then at least you're on the same page. Right. There might be people who are like, yes, please tell me where to go and what to do and how to act. And they like that. You know, it's like people maybe who go, hey, I want to go to a job. And when the job is done at five o'clock, I want to turn it off and I don't want to think about it. Everybody is different. Yeah. It's all good. It's okay. But line up with somebody. And I am yeah. definitely married to somebody who does not want to be controlled. So how the hell could he come home? You come home and have him yell at you for being and being controlling towards you. Like, where were you? I know. It's he was so having weird. a moment. He was just having a moment. I think it was also like his way of like, well, maybe he wanted to see me or He's like, you know, a so it's a little, a little of that Aww. too. Yeah. So That's it's kind of cute. Okay. That's the other side of it. It's cute. He missed you. He yeah. wanted you home. And it's also being able to recognize that in the moment mm -hmm. quickly instead yeah. of like, true. Really? So it's, listen, relationships are, um, cohabitating with another person, what, what, whichever type of relationship you're in, I think is tricky because it's, you're, you're sharing this space Yeah. and everybody has rules about their space and everybody's rules are different. Why do you think that really romantic relationships are different than friendships? Well, usually you don't live with your friends and True. what your expectation is from your friends is, is different. That's and true. you're always sort of looking, you're sort of, I think, secretly angling to get something from your partner. Hmm. And I also think once we flip it sometimes and say, you know what, I'm just going to love you the best I can. What you end up getting back is so much bigger mm -hmm. than if you're angling. Mm. If you just go like, because like if Laird decides one day, like maybe mm. he, he wants to go, I, I would be like, wow, I really gave my best. And then I would be like, good luck mm -hmm. because that's all I can do. Yeah. And what happens is, is I think when we really try our best, people usually recognize that and they go, it's pretty good here. 
Yeah. You know, my girlfriends and I were talking about it um, earlier this year on a, on a little girl's trip. And um, it really came down to, for us, we were talking about attachment, non-attachment, like being detached from the outcome with a friend, yeah. totally detached from the outcome. Gabby, if you're rude to me, mean to me, you don't call me back, you don't follow through, you, you know, you're not c- contributing to the friendship by being vulnerable. Sure. I just don't care if I'm not your friend anymore. Yeah. I'll go get another one. Yeah. And in a relationship, you are attached to the outcome. You're like, sure. so you pardon them along the way and you want something from them. You want them to meet the expectations that get to this certain attached point out here of like, mm-hmm. we're married forever. We have a great family we're perfect and there's it's just not it's just no. the attachment non-attachment is what we figured out is like the problem because you're okay to see a friend go because you don't like you don't attach yourself to some distant outcome with that friend it's just here and now it's just here and now but that's what it is every day for all of us well you can choose that with a partner but we the, it, i mean no, i fall victim to thinking way ahead i'm, I'm a forward thinker not a back thinker so if you ask me if i would mm. ever if i regret anything in my past i really don't because i really do like that is my answer like i'm total butterfly effect i'm happy where i am here today and wouldn't yeah. change a thing i also don't spend any time thinking about that yeah i'm always thinking forward so that's my problem is that's i'm super too. attached to the future and yeah. an outcome and mm. it makes it really hard for me to operate in the present sometimes and flow because mm. I get attached to outcomes. Okay, but let's let's look at that really quickly. When you're driving a vehicle, you have to understand where you're going to be very quickly, very soon. Mm-hmm. So it makes perfect sense to sort of be anticipating, mm-hmm. okay, what's happening. So I think in one way, it's about giving yourself uh, understanding that it makes a lot of sense that you're that that is a, a sort of feeling of a natural way for you to be. Mm-hmm. And I think. Um, you know, when you when you move through life and if you really ask some questions and you start to kind of dig deep on a lot of things, which I know you do already, is you start to realize, how do I, yes, plan for the future? Because, you know, life takes a level of navigating. Yeah. We have to navigate. Some intention. But how do I understand that really, not only am I not in control of it, um, I have been in a, a long relationship and I have three daughters and I tell you each day that I wake up, I realize I'm going to earn it today. Like I earned my, my marriage today. And um, that's really all I can do because I don't know if Laird and I are going to be married in 10 years or in one year mm-hmm. for whatever reasons mm-hmm. are out there. Mm-hmm. And so I would get up and when I put my feet on the floor, I say, okay, I'm going to do my mm-hmm. best to earn it. And whatever right. happens, happens. And that comes down to dating someone and thinking of marrying them. And, and I'll tell you what's, what's the heaviest of all is children. Because, you know, I, when they hand you a baby, you can make all kinds of plans. And you get a kid, all of a sudden you start watching them and you're like, oh, they're good at this and they're talented at that. And you can start really looking. And what you realize is that you actually are not really in charge of that. You're just not really in control of it. So mm-hmm. what you can do is keep them safe and love them and, and expose them to things. But let me tell you, when your kids do things that they like, that you hate. You're like, who are you? <laughs> and, you and it is the biggest lesson because you go, oh, yes, that's right. You are not me and we're mm-hmm. separate. And even though I had this plan for you, mm-hmm. you have another plan. Mm. And so... I think it's it's a level of surrendering that is so uncomfortable, um, but once you get into it more and more, I think it opens up the way you can see everything, and you just kind of go, oh, okay, uh, you know, I can only impact my outward life by my my own actions and thoughts and feelings right. and really it's thoughts right like right. you know that from saying like oh totally. i'm going to train i'm going to eat this because mm-hmm. you're making choices yeah and we can take those same choices and say i'm this is i'm going to choose this in a relationship or how i'm going to react or things like that so it's um i think to be more in charge in charge and to and to even get bigger with it is to actually find the way to kind of say okay i'll loosen up on the I mean, even metaphorically, you hold on to a wheel and make the car go where you want it to go. Death grip. I've had the death grip my whole life. Right. So Let go. It, it makes a lot of sense. But even when I retired, that was what I said was I had to learn the difference between quitting and letting go. 
because you just, I mean, like, again, I'm hold on, right? You just keep going. And then my sister's described me as she's like, you have stamina for everything. Mm -hmm. Like you are a go, go, go. You don't tire. Right. And I had to learn the difference between quitting and letting go, not only from a verbiage standpoint, but the way that that, those words Mm. sunk in and felt for me, Mm -hmm. right? Because if someone talked about me being done racing and I thought it was quitting, I'd be guarded. I'd be, I'd be offended at times. I'd Mm -hmm. feel insecure, Mm -hmm. but I let go and I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. Or how about if they come up to you and go, Oh, so what are you doing now that you're not racing? Yeah. All that identity, right? Right. Exactly. And then it's like, you should just say this and that because you don't have to go, well, I'm doing this and then I'm traveling and then I have a podcast and all that because now you're, you're having to explain to somebody, Oh, well, I'm going to reinforce this identity. Right. It doesn't matter. My friends, um, who came to some friends came to visit a couple weeks ago. Um, and they own a company that, um, helps people, um, you know, helps people with their business as a business owner from the inside out and outside in. So finances, but also then the personal relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just do a great job of being really thorough about that. And so, um, so it's, it's, uh, hang on, what did you say? I totally lost my train Oh, of no, we were just talking about identity and like, oh, what do you, you know, oh, yeah, so what's that's the it. plan now? So they're, so they're, so they're just hanging out? Are you hanging out? Yeah, that's it. Oh, that's so they go favorite. to a party. I want to punch people in the face when they talk to me like that. <laughs> so they go to a party and they play this game that when people ask them, oh, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And they look at each other and go, oh, I, um, I surf. Um, mm-hmm. I like to spend time with my daughter. Um, mm-hmm. And they go on and they talk about all the things they like to do. Mm-hmm. But then they go, oh, you want to know what we do for like to make money? Because mm-hmm. that's different. Yeah, and it also sounds as crappy of a question as it can be, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. I think that that's another thing of having many iterations of a career where I'm at is, and and even watching Laird, Laird is one is so uber talented, but didn't get really mainstream recognition until he was in his mid thirties, mm-hmm. and it's realizing like that's all made up. And so if you're doing stuff that you feel really good about and you're around people that you really dig and they love you, um, that's what you're doing. And it isn't about like, I'm the fastest and I'm a race car and I'm the only female. I'm the first female. It's like, that's just stuff that can keep us from... Just fills TV time. (laughs) It's all... (laughs) Magazine articles. You know, and and like... You You know, know. and uh, people have to realize like, oh, the newest and the latest and the greatest and the has been and then the comeback Mm. and then all this stuff that they do to keep the stories going. You have three girls. Mm. How... How do you, how do you make them understand that? How do you make them understand? How do you, you know, you grew up yeah. not having to be anything you said, right? right. Like you don't ha- you never had to be something when you grew up, which is Nothing. an amazing fundamental that allows you so much space to be whoever it is that you are, which so many of us just are who we are told to be, who, sure. who our parents think we should be or what our parents do. Um, so how do you like take those fundamentals that are so good but hard mm-hmm. and like get your teenage kids to like grasp that consistency. You got to be it and they'll watch you and they won't believe you and they will do it very different. And then they'll, I think it starts to sink in and then they will also do things differently than you do. Mm. And, um, and that's okay too. But trying to figure out how to take the pressure off of them is the hardest thing I have because I'm yeah. always like thinking to your point I was saying especially kind of one of my daughters two are are different they're not it doesn't seem to bother them as much but one feels like this you know pressure from inside her own self not a message from Laird and I of like I have to do something but also that might be what's driving her so I think it's hard Mm. for her but the expectation is trying just to remind her you're you we're Mm. us just being you and Laird is enough to make a child think that they have to do something. I know. I do just feel don't like you have to that. overcompensate for that verbally. No, because words mean nothing. Um, it's just about showing them over and over. Also, as people, like, what do we place value on? So we don't place value on like, oh yeah, hey, you know, you got into this school and got yeah, this it's like I, it's like, hey, work hard figure out who you are, what, what kind of, what turns you on Mm. and, um, and try to be a good friend and have good friends. And like, if you can sort of accomplish those things, because everything takes hard work. And so getting them to understand the value of hard work and, um, and, and also, you know, a level of kindness to other people Mm -hmm. and, and, 
and encourage them to, to simultaneously know how to stand up for themselves. I think that that's important too. It's like, hey, you don't have to take people's crap. But as far as going out in the world and being someone, well, what does that mean? I mean, it's such a ridiculous thing. It's it like, is. hey, listen, Caesar's dead, Napoleon's dead. It's like Marilyn Monroe's dead. I mean, we yeah. can just go through time and history and talk about every most powerful, important person that there's ever been. They're not here. Justin Bieber would be more important to my 11-year-old, you know, than, uh, you know, Roosevelt. So at what point, what are we really talking about? It's just something that we do to occupy ourselves. And so let's really go back into like, who am I and what do I want to do? Because that's really kind of the only, I think one of the only real things. Yeah. Is it hard to be a parent? Oh my God. It's the hardest. Is it harder than playing volleyball at the level that you did? Oh yeah. All day long. I think, um, why is that? You love them. They love you. Yeah. It's a uh, family, yeah. like oh, what, yeah. what mate, right? And volleyball, like there people are there to crush you, you know, it's competitive. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter is it as you much. Care? Is it, do you care more? Yeah. It, you, you care where, way more. And also it's your one shot. Like if I lose a game, I can mean? go back. Well, like you know, your kids. You have one shot at that game too. Yes, but you sort of have this different arc and it's it's just different. This is like, hey, I've got to invest this time and energy and try to make good decisions right now because that's going to get baked in there okay. and then they're going to be this right. age. But like each also, season you could start over kind with, a, of. With, a se- with, a, with a volleyball season, but, but with kids, they're not going to forget when you lashed out or they're not going to forget right. when you demonstrated something that was counterintuitive to what you've been saying or... Well, and actually too, what's interesting, and I didn't realize this until my kids were older, is that also, what is also very hard about parenting, is that there will be things that happen to them outside of Mm. your control that you were protecting them from or whatever. And so you are dealing with outside forces or situations that make it more complicated. My sister's little girls will come home and start to say new things, act a certain way. And my sister will be like, she learned that from so-and-so at school. Yeah. You know, yeah. like little things when they're a kid, but surely as you get older, even more, bigger things. Yeah, or if, or if they, you know, make choices that are not good for themselves and you have to ride that out mm. with them. And uh, Do you try and ride it out or do you try and fix it? I think the impulse is to want to fix it. I think when you when you really step back and try to really look at what is parenting, which is to guide this person to a place where they can manage their own lives, not control their lives. There's levels of it where you have to ride it out because you got to get that knife involved. You need to help them. But when it's a butter knife, you can just kind of let them figure it out. Right. Like the littler things. Yes. And sometimes they have to, they have to fall and Mm -hmm. it's hard to watch. And I, and, and, um, and you have to also have belief in the foundation that you've put in too. Yeah. So when your children are small, you have a lot of control. And so you can be with them and love them mm-hmm. and you know feed them well and do all mm-hmm. this stuff. And then as they become independent, there's stuff sometimes that you have to watch. You have to be like, and you're like, God, why'd you do Oh, that? you wish it was just eating McDonald's. <laughs> I'll take that, that's child's play. Um, um, it's just, I think it's, and it's also, I'll tell you what's really uncomfortable, like it would crack you open like an egg is all of a sudden, I had someone point this out to me two years ago. You have a hammer. I have a hammer. I use my hammer a lot. I can hammer down, hammer through. And then she's like, and now with that tool, you're going to wash the windows. And so what does that mean? That means Mm. you need a new tool. And you're like, oh, but that's so uncomfortable. Mm, I'm good with the hammer, though. It works so quick. My hammer has worked. Look, my hammer's worked for 30 years. I feel like you're telling my story, but keep going, yes. But so this is one thing. But because you love your children so much, you go, you know what? And I would do it for my partner. I'm going to take a look at that. And I'm going to maybe be willing to go to areas of myself and life that are very uncomfortable for me because I would like to develop a new tool so that I can help this manage this for this child. Mm-hmm. Um, because what you don't need to show them is that you're perfect. What you need to show them is that you're willing to try and mm. you're also willing to try something new. Mm. And, yeah. um, that yeah. was very uncomfortable. Kid, really? 
Yeah, you I mean, kids I hear all... this all the time. I hear like you've worked your whole life by by pushing through. Like yeah. that's worked for you. The tough has worked for you, but you don't have to do that anymore. No. And like I hear that and I'm like, but it works so good. My yeah. hammer works so good. Yeah. And he's like, it doesn't serve you anymore. No. And like my advice for like even this, he's like, you realize you're going to get so much further if you put the hammer down and you just listen to people. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. It's like, I feel like this is my therapy because I'm such a talker. So I'm just going to shut up right now. Well, no, it's, listen, we're all, that's the whole great thing about life, right? Is each like day you could tr- do something differently and new and, and you could then string days of that together and look back like a year or two and be like, wow, I do that a lot better now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is growth too. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's good, but it's also kind of going like, oh yeah, I, I don't really like this or even feeling disappointed as a parent there's moments where you go well I thought if I did all the right things and I I kept a place you know safe and clean and they I provided them with education and love and you know Laird and I don't beat the hell out of each other and like all these things that like you wouldn't be you wouldn't have to deal with certain things or certain things wouldn't have to come upon your children and you realize that's just not the case and so you have choices to make. And that's why I can remember thinking, oh, I, now I know why parents say, well, that's how we do it in this house and that's the way it is, final. Because in certain ways, that's easier. Because then yeah. you don't have to look at yourself and be like, oh, you know, because we all have our own crap still layered in there, yeah. no matter how much we've sort of worked on it. Yeah. So we have go-tos that are safe. Yeah. And um, Easy. Yep. Familiar. And they've worked. Yeah. Like and they overall... Worked, yeah. The overall. So I want to talk about this concept of having it all because I have my I have my perspective. On okay, it. having it all. Yeah, I think you like can't. This you culture cannot. of like oh, yeah. everything's about ridiculous. everything's perfect. Like have it be a strong woman, have a family, be it's this, ridiculous. be that. It's ridiculous. And I think it's interesting. You know, we always say like you never ask men. What if a guy goes to work and you're like, oh, but you didn't get to see the kids at school, right? I think it's an unfair. And I say this on the, the women's side meaning why is it like men can't have it all why do we think we can have it all Mm -hmm. like we teach a kid like okay we're at the birthday party there's a cupcake and ice cream so you can't have both so make a choice right (laughs) like this is stuff that we've learned very early i think you can have it all but not all at the same time Mm -hmm. so i think you can have different chapters of your life experiencing different things but the idea of like well i should be able to have it all it's like okay well let's grow up and be adults and realize that that is not really practical. And so the fact that if a woman is working and she decides she wants to have a kid, puts her at a disadvantage biologically and emotionally, (laughs) if they want to make that into a cultural conversation about it not being fair, I think is ridiculous because part of it's biology. Mm -hmm. Laird can't have the baby, Mm -hmm. Laird can't nurse the baby. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you couldn't have ripped me out of my house uh, anyway. Hey, you're the CEO and here's your zeros and you're in charge. I'd be like, yeah, no, right now, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that was my choice. And by the way, there are women who don't have that luxury. Like they have to go back to work because- They have to feed their family. That's what's happening. And you know what? Keep the roof over their head. Good on them and let's support them. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is when we also try to compare or align that with the men's experience, Um, do I think our culture could do a better job of supporting new moms, working new moms? Absolutely. Like if you go to Scandinavian countries, it's like, Hey, this much time for the mom, even the dad. However, what we say in the U S is, Hey, this is a competitive environment. You can be anything you want to be, but guess what? It's sort of every man for himself. So that doesn't make it right but it's set up all the way around to be like that. So Mm -hmm. now you have a mom who's a working mom and a new mom and the culture pretty much says the same thing to her. So will she lose the promotion possibly to her male counterpart because he can work 12 hours and she has to, she can't possibly. Do you think that's fair? I don't know what that means. What if she's better at her job, but she can't do it and he's, I mean, cause she chose to have children. Cause she, of course it's not fair, but like, I have said to my kids, if you want fair, go to the fairground. Like, is it fair that I could hit a white ball and get paid some weird amount of money compared to somebody who has to work construction and bust their ass for 14 hours? It's ridiculous. 
there's unfair all around. So mm -hmm. I think it's about understanding what you want to manage, right. what you want, what you and want. how do you do that, and understand where the pitfalls are going to be and where mm -hmm. it's unfair and crappy. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want the kids, then you also get the advantage of being able to have that super deep connection. Yeah. You get right. You, you're having the baby yourself. It's coming out of your yes. body. You get to be home with it. You get to you get to have that connection. You get to you know inspire them, make a little, a little mini amazing human. And there's you're really a lot romanticizing of this whole positive thing. experience. <laughs> As opposed to like grinding yeah. it out at work. And you, know, you can right? do that you too. You can look at the two sides of it and say like, you know, and you also have the choice, right? If you don't want, I think if you want the promotion, I think it's you viable. know what your choice is. I think it's a very viable thing for a woman to say, you know what? I think what's going to make me feel good mm -hmm. is to crush it at work. Mm -hmm. And guess what? She will. And she could become the boss and will become the boss. And if she says, hmm, maybe I'd like to explore being, you know, I, I feel like I'd like to express myself in motherhood. And by the way, none is better than the other. I always say to people, I will never romanticize marriage or parenthood. Mm -hmm. It's really an individual choice. And it's really to know yourself and what's going to turn you on. And at the end of your life, you go, you know what? I did it my way. I did it the way that made me feel good. Mm -hmm. But I think the better question is not, is it fair? It's tough. Is it tough? It is tough. Mm -hmm. And I think for women too, it's like, how do you keep your thread of your career going and try to have children? And that is a really, it will be the ongoing question forever and ever mm -hmm. because it's hard. Mm -hmm. Because also being a mother, right, is sort of still, especially when they're young. There's a stillness. Mm. And even like, you ever see a dog give birth and then like the puppies and like, you know, she lays there and it's like, oh God, here they come. There's even like, you know, when you first have a kid, it's like, okay. And if you think like you can be exactly the way you were, you know, before you had a kid, can you go back? Absolutely. But in these pockets, it is so still. Yeah. I mean, like you almost want to like, you know, there's days where you're just even like. Even for the least motivated, they'd still be bored. I mean, it's ma it's so <laughs> magical. But you're just yeah. like, okay, here I am. You well, know? That's your test then, right? And the world is moving ahead without me, mm, yeah. you know? Right, that insecurity shows oh, up yeah. of like, I'm not accomplishing anything. Right. As I'm sure what I'd be thinking, I'd be like, yeah. I'm not doing anything. I'm so worthless right now. Yeah. Wait, oh wait, this baby will die without me. That's not super worthless yeah. then. <laughs> well, and it's... And it goes by They're in a just like, it's so quick. So yeah. I think it's just understanding what you can handle and what you want. Yeah. But to, you know say that it because because by the way i wouldn't i even if let's say laird couldn't nurse i wouldn't want him to mm -hmm. i would want to be the one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i want to talk about this just because i feel like we can relate to each other on it and i think we, we would this would be an interesting conversation but you know you have girls growing up you don't know what they're going to do mm -hmm. one of them is in sports mm -hmm. um and Look, you were, I wrote it down, you were Nike's first spokeswoman. Mm -hmm. Elle Magazine named you top five beautiful women in the world. You've modeled, you've had endorsements, like mm -hmm. you've been the face of things. So being a woman and using looks, like that mm -hmm. is something mm -hmm. that always comes up in my world sure. as far as, you know, less now because I'm not in sports anymore, mm -hmm. but man, that was a thing for a while. Well, and so- Well, and um, you're race car driving too, that's even more exaggerated. Right, to contra contrast it even more. Yeah. Um, so. Like, what's your feelings on all that? Like, what would you, what would you, how would you, how would you use what you've learned to mm -hmm. help your girls have an understanding for how to be strong and what it is that they're comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good And not question. worry about what people say, because there's so much things, so much is said about, you know, sexuality. And like, women just aren't able to be sexual without it being a problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, or pretty without it being a problem. You're losing, you're using your looks. You're like, yeah, I have long hair. Well, I don't anymore, but <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's it. it for What'd me, you it was, deal a, with? well, for me, it was, a, it's a complex in a different way because so when I was coming up and then I was, went to college to play volleyball, then I started modeling legitimately and it created an independence for me. I gave up my college scholarship to play mm -hmm. ball that I was, and I paid to play at school because I was an independent person. Mm -hmm. I had, I wasn't relying on my parents. Yeah. So I took it as a job basically. So then when I got into professional sports, 
my thing was I'm going to train really hard. I'm going to be a really good teammate. You know, I'm going to be very professional. And um, I'm what did very... did that mean you didn't do then? Uh, well, it also meant that I... Professional just meaning like if I lost and just got my ass kicked and got off the court and people, 50 people are standing there, or, you know, to do whatever, sign something and be gracious, I would. That's mm. part of being professional, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, Sometimes. Yeah, well, I mean... I think also you have to realize I was on a in, on a very small platform, mm -hmm. so I call it the song and dance. So I was looking at my sports platform mm -hmm. and going like I see very clearly all the limitations here. Mm -hmm. And so if playing a card that I have in my deck uh, that I have nothing to do with, I, I I didn't work for that. I just for whatever reason. Um, and I do it tastefully and correctly to the best of, to a place that I feel comfortable with, then um, it will provide more opportunity for me and it will bring more attention to my sport. And in that order, by the way, I'm not going to BS and say, well, for my sport, more opportunity for me and for my sport. Um, I'm comfortable doing that as long as the other stuff was in order. Mm -hmm. And it always was. Mm -hmm. I always trained hard. I was always straight ahead. I always did the extra. Um, and people can say, it's not fair. Okay, it's not. I totally own it. And I played with girls who could jump, you know, eight inches higher than me. Mm -hmm. Did they not, you know, it's like... Is that not fair? Because they were born with, born with that? Right. <laughs> so I think it was... But listen, also, I never... Sh and certainly as I got older, I didn't shy away from what it is. I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And I knew exactly um, just kind of how far to push it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I thought as long as I was showing up and working really hard, yeah. I, I felt comfortable managing that. Yeah. But yes, it was, oh yeah, people had some dialogue for me for sure. Yeah, and that's okay. Doing the work for the job is number one, of course, because mm -hmm. you know, you've earned it then, right? You feel like you've earned it more so when you're like, look, I'm working really hard, like I'm putting in the effort, I mean, it should be easy if it's your passion, which, yeah. you know, volleyball was yours and racing was mine, but, but that's part of it. That way, when someone says something negative, then you can't feel, you don't feel bad. Cause you're like, I just did everything I could. Like I've yeah. been working well, my butt it. off. And then you have no reason to feel guilty or inse in, insecure because you know, you've done everything that you possibly can. And, you know, it's a powerful place to be in to do that to be it, confident in your efforts yes. so that whatever happens afterwards. Yes. But look, there's a pros and cons for all of it. And, yeah. you know, well, and at 23, I, it was hard. Like when I was 22, You were leading the way. Like you lit, led the way on a woman being able to be beautiful and an athlete. I was there at the right time. Let's just say that. There was other athletes who sort of tilled the ground for mm -hmm. me. So when my generation came, it was ready to roll. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, but at 23, I was like, oh, you know. Staying in your comfort zone is the critical element, I think, because yes. I always did that. Now, I'm not saying that I have the same comfort zone as you or her Correct. or him. Like, I'm not saying they're the same, but it's mine. Correct. And there was plenty of things I said no to. Yeah. Especially in my GoDaddy days. There's plenty of stuff I said no to. Sure. I mean, I was given concepts for Super Bowl commercials. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's a good one. Yeah. yeah I'm not really comfortable with that. And you that's know, important, too, to be yeah. in charge of it. Yeah. You, and, I didn't do things that I wasn't comfortable with, but I yeah. have a large comfort zone. Yeah. I have. <laughs> I felt, yes. And I think also with my size and everything, I had a different relationship with just, you know, you're playing volleyball and, you know, ba it's just, you know, on and on, like bathing mm -hmm. suits and stuff like that. But. I think that, 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 you know, the image stuff is tricky, right? Because that we live in a world where there's so much image, right? There's so mm -hmm. much facade out there and social media is like the, you know, is a wonder, can be a wonderful platform, but it can also be extremely dangerous and has developed so many insecurities. And I think that it's really led women to maybe men too, of course, but I feel like it's more of a female thing. Mm -hmm. um, the comparison, comparison is a thief of joy. Yeah. True. Um, but to, you know, think about, you know, what it is that's going to attract a guy, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I loved when I was reading some information about you, there was a wonderful, wonderful bit of information that I read that I thought, yes, how do we teach girls that this is what's important? And I'm going to read it. Laird said, this is about meeting you and about 
Mm -hmm. you know, the first time you guys met and then um, what attracted him to you. And he said, ultimately, it wasn't love at first sight. It was an infatuation after first conversation. My intrigue of Gabby was brought to life after realizing how smart she was. Mm -hmm. And we think that we're supposed to go out there and put this beauty filter on and that's what we're going to get a guy from. Yeah. And, you know, how do we, like, how do we, how do we build strong, independent, ambitious, fit? I'm not even going to say pretty because if you're confident and you're fit and you take care of yourself and you treat yourself with respect, it's going to show. You're hot. You Mm -hmm. are. You're going to be. It's just Mm going to happen. It's going to be a byproduct of giving a shit about yourself. That's right. Um, which then it makes you give a shit about other people because we treat people how we treat ourselves. Right. Um, how do we build? How do we build these people? Even yeah. guys too, but I think yeah. it's a little bit more of a vulnerability for girls. I think first of all, it does start with our moms, and the other thing I, I tell my girls is develop a skill, something you're in charge of. Mm. Because if you like me or don't like me, or you think I'm attractive or not. I can't control that. Mm -hmm. But if I have a skill that I'm working on and all of a sudden I go to practice and I'm a little bit better because I practice. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, the power that we get when when we're good at something or we like something, we're passionate about something. So I always tell my girls that it has to start there. And, um, and, you know, certainly pretty is, is bonus. But, you know, I, I read this once that if, if beauty is your currency, then starting, you know, then you get poorer each day, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> you think like at the longer, hopefully, like I, you know, I, I'll be 50 next year. Hopefully the longer I'm around, the more, the m- I can continue to contribute. Yeah. But I have to do that by continuing to develop myself as a, as a, as a thinking person, mm-hmm. not just a woman and not how's my butt look. Um, because not only are there millions of those, um, then there are, and it's, it's, um, it's a really tough, uh, treadmill to be on. If you're like, do I look good? Am I skinny? Is my weight? And am I pretty? How's my skin? It's like, it's just, it's, it's really, it's really tough. So I think it's, if, if your mom's to be an example, even like you putting out that image out there about like, Hey, I'll race with the boys and all this stuff. These things are impactful, but it's too, but what's hard. And I've talked about this a little bit is now you add social media, which actually reinforces that pretty's good enough. Mm-hmm. Because it's like she gets more followers and more likes. And then the drop off that cliff is pretty ugly. Mm. So if you do that long enough and then you didn't spend that time investing in yourself right. and doing that work, because it is work. You're outside of yourself for validation and yeah. it's gonna go away. Yeah. Either you're gonna go away or they're gonna, for it's whatever reason, temporary. Yes, and I think what's interesting about experience, Laird and I talk about this a lot, is like, you just can't fake that. You have to lay down the work. Mm -hmm. And so when people do that, um, I think their life, then their currency, it's like, yeah, of course, when you're 13 to 30, uh, you know, and you're at your height of biological signaling, if you're sort of in a, you know, conventional life, your path is certainly different. But it's like, yeah, that should be more of the story because you are going like, hey, mm-hmm. I'm here to make babies. Like people forget the biology and the all biology that, of it, right? 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 So I understand that it's more important, but even beyond that, then you sort of go, okay, simultaneously to that, who am I developing as a person and what skills am I developing? So I'm contributing beyond like, you know, how do I look? And then as you get older, I think it becomes also, how am I gonna support the world that I've created? So is it my family and my friends? And if I'm in a community and if I have longer arms, fine. And also, how am I going to continue to make, to know how to make myself feel good? Because if you don't know how to do that, and then you start getting older, it is really tough. I think it could be really tough. And then also you, you keep your power. It just shifts. So your power shifts from just being youthful and all these things to now you've got life's experience. Maybe, you know, I always joke, I'm like, it doesn't matter if I have fine lines because I'm someone's boss. You know, it's like, it doesn't really matter if, mm-hmm. you know, they want to have sex with me because that's not where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. But I think it's, it's sort of just getting, but no 12 or 13 year old can really think about that stuff. Yeah. So ultimately you have to have examples out there and you have to model it. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, you just do like a lot of, like you, 
lot of growing really, souls. I mean, yeah, if you, it was, if the hope. path was easy and laid out and predict, you know, if we just knew all the answers, it wouldn't be fun. It wouldn't be, you wouldn't grow. It wouldn't be an adventure. Right. Because look, when the things, when the shit hits the fan, that's where you're making memories, right? right. You don't well, remember when everything's yeah. super smooth. You're just like, it was nice. Oh you yeah, know? right. So go ahead and yeah. like, just you know, have a goal. You know, I think this is a morbid thing to do, but maybe this would be an interesting concept at whatever age was appropriate. But uh, I think I told you the other day at workout, but I wrote my obituary. Oh yeah, that's heavy. I wrote how I wanted to be remembered. Yeah. And maybe that would be, for me, it was um, important because it showed me something I needed to work on. Mm. Um, but maybe that's something that you could sort of reevaluate and, and, and redo on a random, on a regular basis. I'm not saying like yeah. every day or every week or every month, but no. not even, maybe not even every year, but every couple of years you rebaseline and go, how do I want to be remembered? Because it's going to evolve and change. And that's totally fine too. And I think that's also something that people that is fine to understand is that your life won't just be the same. It's not going to no. be, it's not going to be linear. You're not going to do one thing your whole life. And in fact, you should do as many things as you possibly can that fill your soul. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think what is interesting, two things I think also start to happen is as uh, you have a little more experience is certain things become so clear and so simple. And then you start to realize how much you just don't know. Easily, right? Some of it comes easily. Yeah. So you go like, like oh. wow, this is exciting. It's, it's all very simple. I don't waste my time in a lot of emotional upheaval. Uh, if I suspect something's going to be happening in drama, I'm out of it before I ever get into it. Um, and simultaneously, it's like opening one door and seeing a hundred more doors and going, oh yeah, I don't really know anything. And then those two things living comfortably side by side. Um, and also, you know, again, like you said, being willing to just kind of look at it and go, oh, you know what? I, I might need to make a change. So I think it's an ongoing, uh, the dance of life. And, um, and I, I also believe if we have people that we really are excited about, or, uh, that we're excited about around us, that really are giving us love and we are taking care of ourselves, that um, that's probably a, a yeah. pretty good place to start. Find good people and take care of yourself. Yeah. And have people tell you the because truth, you'll though. you'll be able to take care of others then. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Gabby. This was yeah, fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. And also thank you so much Trevor Hall for the awesome music. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.